Great. All right, this is our third session. And as you can see uh, up on the screen, we're going to be hitting the practices and the beliefs of Islam. We're going to look at these different practices and the different beliefs. There are basically five practices and six beliefs. That's all you have to do to be a Muslim. Very simple, isn't it? And I'm sure all of you know what those five practices are. I'm sure you, if I could just ask you right off the top of your head, you would know what they are. I'm just going to go through them real quickly and just see if you do know them. The first one would be the shahada, which would be the statement of faith that every Muslim must say. The second would be the salat. The salat would be the prayer uh, that they pray five times a day. The third one would be the psalm or the Ramadan fast that they do once a year. A, using a month, uh, particular, I hope I'm going the same sequence that I have on your paper. If not, uh, uh, forgive me. The fourth one would be the zakat, which would be the uh, tithing, uh, about 2.5%. And then the last one would be what we know as the hajj or the pilgrimage. So the shahada, the salat, the psalm or Ramadan fast, the zakat, and then the last would be the hajj. These are the Arabic names that are given to each one of these five pillars. These are all that Muslims have to do. It's very simple. And that's one of the great attractions of Islam right there. Uh, when I was studying for my masters, I did a, my thesis on, this, on the very attraction of Islam. What is it and why is it that Muslims or the people become Muslims? What is it that attracts them to Islam? And right near the top of the list was this idea of its simplicity. The fact that it's rational, that it makes sense, that it's not difficult to follow. If that's all you have to do, you can see why many people have become Muslims and many people are retained by Islam. Now what we want to do tonight is we want to look at these five beliefs and then we want to look at the six, I'm sorry, the five practices and then look at the six beliefs and we want to unpack them a bit and help you to understand how you can use them and what is it the Muslims are saying through them. Let's start with the first one, the shahada. Statement of faith. La illa illa lala. And when you look at that and you hear it's being pronounced, then uh, you can tell my, my pronunciation is absolutely atrocious. Uh, I use a very Indian accent because that's why I grew up, unfortunately. But when you hear that, and you've heard many Muslims use it, basically it's that there is no God but Allah. That's all it says, there is no God but Allah. You'll find that if you look in your Qurans in Surah 2, Ayah 225, uh, 255, uh, Surah 28, Ayah 88, and Surah 112, Ayah 1 to 4. But there's something missing, isn't there? That's not the whole shahada. That's only the first half of the shahada. And what's curious is that you will not find the entire shahada, the first and the second part, which is Muhammad Rasulullah, that Muhammad is the, the uh, messenger of God. You will not find it anywhere in the Quran together. It's broken up. You'll find that last part, while Muhammad Rasulullah in Surah 33, Ayah 40, Surah 48, Ayah 29, and Surah 64, Ayah 8. And that's curious, because certainly if it is the statement of faith, if this is the thing that you must say, this is the phrase you must say when you are converted, uh, this is what you must say before you go and do the Hajj, before you move into Mecca, uh, they get them on the plane uh, as they're flying over, coming into uh, Arab air, uh, Arabic airspace, a lot of times the whole plane will say it, or if you want to uh, come by car before you move in, before they allow you to come into Mecca, you have to be able to say this phrase and mean it. So obviously it's a very important phrase, and this is what all Muslims must say to prove that they are Muslims. Why then, therefore, can you not find it in its entirety in the Quran? That's the first question you need to ask. What's interesting is also is when it was finally included. It's not till the ninth century, 800s, that we finally find Al-Bukhari, the, the compiler of the Hadith, the one who is referred to as Sahih Bukhari, the most important of the Hadith compilers. Uh, we'll talk more about that next week. Uh, you will only find this phrase in its, comple uh, in its completeness in his traditions or in his compilations. That's the mid 9th century. He died in around 870. So you can see there is a problem if they have to wait 230 years to find that entire phrase finally written out. What's more, we have also been able to find the, what they call the Muhammadan formula. That's the uh, Muhammad Rasulullah, that phrase itself is first inscribed on any inscription uh, in 690 
Muhammad died in 632, 690. You're talking about six years, 60 years later, roughly 60 to 70 years later, before even that reference to Muhammad as a prophet of God, the universal prophet of God, is finally included. Now, that may not bother many of you, but it bothers me as a historian because obviously if this is something that Muhammad came to do, if this is something Muhammad came to say, if this is exactly what all Muslims have been saying since the very inception of Islam, then of course you've got a problem here. Why is it not in the Quran and why is it not on the Prophet's lips? I leave that for you to decide. Ask your Muslim friends, see if they're aware of this. They probably won't be. Most of them have not really unpacked it, and so we're doing that now, and of course we're bringing that to the fore. There have been um, some inscriptions that have been found in the Negev Desert, uh, there uh, in what is a part of Israel today, and when, you, when they have found these inscriptions, these are Arabic inscriptions, and these are some of the earliest inscriptions that have been dated by the historians, men like Yehuda Nevo, who is uh, head of the Department of Islam there in the uh, University of Jerusalem, and he has looked at these inscriptions and he has found that the earliest inscriptions do not have this reference to Muhammad as a prophet. In fact, all the earliest inscriptions that he has been able to uncover, and he's uncovered hundreds of them in the seventh century, all of them, none of them I should say, none of them include that the prophet, the prophet Muhammad is a prophet until 690 until that period when you find the first reference to Muhammad as a prophet on the Dome of the Rock, that great building that you see in the central part of Jerusalem, the beautiful golden dome, and it's on the inner ambulatories, the inner, the inner part of that building. That's the first reference you have it, and it's the only first time that it's on any inscription. Now that's also curious to me, because if Muhammad is the prophet of God, the greatest prophet, the seal of all prophets, then why does nobody know about him? Well, we'll talk more about that next week when we start unpacking historically the Quran. And we're going to do some material next week that will be very controversial, very exciting, because it's amazing what we're finding out about these historical facts, these artifacts that are now coming to the fore. And we're starting to look at them, unpack them, and starting asking some very damaging questions because of them. So you don't have that reference at all in its entirety in the Quran. It's split up. Now, why do they say it? Well, they do it out of obedience. They say it, obviously, for piety. They do it when they're born. And they whisper it in the right ear and then the left ear. Uh, when they are converted, as I mentioned earlier, after a ritual bath, they do it. And then when they die. So basically, it brings in life, and it also basically says goodbye. At the beginning and at the end of life, you have this shahada. So it's absolutely important that this is given out. It's absolutely important that people do say it. But it's only done for obedience, as we saw last week. Muslims are to obey. Muslims are to submit. That's what a Muslim means. That's what Islam means, to be in submission, to be one who submits. Let's go to the second one then. What are we going to do about Muhammad himself? Who is Muhammad? Well, you'll probably, you'll probably, ask, probably Muslims will come up to you and ask you this question. What do you think about Muhammad? I don't know if any of you have that chance. Uh, a lot of times Muslims ask me that. They want to know what I think about Muhammad. Usually they, end, they start off by saying, listen, we worship, I'm um, not worship, but we honor Jesus. We call him Issa, who is your prophet. Since we honor Jesus, why don't you honor Muhammad? And you're going to have to have a response to that. Now, in about three or four weeks, we're going to actually unpack and look at Muhammad and ask the same question and try to come up with some type of uh, response to that and help you to do that so that you can use it because certainly you're going to have to get some type of, certainly uh, something off the top of your cuff. But we, I always say whenever Muslims ask me that, that there are four reasons why I don't accept him as a prophet and these reasons are all found right there in my scriptures and I go back to my scriptures and it's very clear that there are four criteria that all prophets must fulfill. The first criteria is they must be in the prophetic race. There is a specific race. We see that in Genesis 17 when Abraham asks God, what about my son Ishmael? Why, why isn't you not honoring him? God has promised another son named Isaac and God says, I will honor Ishmael. He will be the father of 12 sons and those 12 sons will be 12 rulers and they will multiply throughout the earth. But my covenant, my covenant is with Isaac. It's very clear in Genesis 17 that the covenant is with Isaac, it's not with Ishmael. Muslims believe that Muhammad comes in the line of Ishmael. I don't think you'll find any Muslim that, that says different. They cannot prove it. They assume that they can prove it, but there, is no, there are no charts. There is no type of tabulation. There is no historical genealogy that we can look at unless those that have been contrived by Muslims. So we don't sit there and bicker with them. 
The difficulty is he's not in the right race. We know that because in Genesis 22, God is very specific when he comes to Isaac and he says, I'm sorry, he comes to Abraham and he says to Abraham, not twice, but three times, he says to Abraham, bring me your one and unique son, your one and only son, Isaac. He's very clear that Abraham only has one son. Though Abraham had two sons at that time, as far as God was concerned, only Isaac was the legitimate son. Muhammad's therefore not in the right race. The second criteria is that what did he do to prove that he was a prophet? Ask your Muslim friends this. Did he do any miracle? Did Muhammad do any miracle? Did he do any prophecy? Those are the two things that prophets do. They either do miracles or they do prophecies. What prophecy did Muhammad do? Well, actually there is one that Muslims like to claim. We'll talk more about that when we go and we unpack Muhammad a bit more. What miracle did he do? Did he do anything that Jesus could do? Absolutely not. I love to open the Quran and I just like to look at Jesus in the Quran, though I don't start the Quran with the Quran uh, as my authority. It's amazing as you look at the Quran almost time after time after time after time, you will see case after case after case where Jesus could do things that Muhammad could not do in the Quran. It was Jesus that could heal, Muhammad could not. It was Jesus that did miracles, Muhammad could do not. It was Jesus that resuscitated the dead, Muhammad never did that. It was Jesus that healed the blind, Muhammad never did that. And it was Jesus, the perfect one. Muhammad was never perfect with anything. He had to ask forgiveness three times in the Quran. Not only the sins that he had done, but the sins that he was going to do in Surah 48, Ayah 2. So over and over again, you'll see Jesus comes out superior to Muhammad even in their Quran. Isn't that great? I love it. Now, I'm not, I don't have to use the Quran for my authority. I don't ask you that you use your Quran for your authority. If you want to read it, it'll put you to sleep. But certainly, what you can do and what you can say to your Muslim friends is when you even look at Jesus and Muhammad, Muhammad always comes out second. He always comes out second. So, what did he do to prove he was a, a prophet? We'll talk more about that in about two or three weeks. I'm going to leave you hanging there. What did he say? Look and see what he said because every prophet must say that which God gives to the other prophets. In other words, there must be a correlation. There must be a theme that goes right through all the prophecies of God. God does not contradict himself, right? And if you have prophets that contradict each other, then you can pretty well stipulate that that prophet does not belong to God. That's another, that's a very good criteria. And for that reason, we look and we ask and see what Muhammad said and what he was revealed. And when you look at the Quran, you will see over and over again that a lot of what Muhammad said contradicts categorically what had come before. And you can see that there he was, uh, he takes Jesus off the cross. Well, we know Jesus was on the cross. You can see already what he did with the son of Abraham. Was it Ishmael? Was it Isaac? These confusions that are all the way through the Quran, you can see, and certainly on the prophet's lips, prove to me that he could not be a prophet of God. And then fourthly, who was his God? Exactly, what God did he follow? Oh, that's a good one, I love it. We'll talk a little bit more about that later tonight when we talk about what and who Allah is, because that's gonna be the, what, the first belief that we refer to. So let's hold off on that one. So in all four categories, he misses out. And you need to give this test. And I, I say it categorically to my Muslim friends. You wanna know what I think about Muhammad? Let me tell you what God tells me about a prophet. Then you decide whether or not Muhammad fulfills those criteria. It's very simple. I cannot speak for my own self. I cannot to give you my own opinion. It's not my own experience. It's not what I want to believe. It's what God tells me. And this is what God tells me. It's very clear. He's giving me these tests. Muhammad fails on all four tests. So, one Miss Muslims will say, well, yes, but he, gives, he is given authority because he's prophesied in the Bible. And usually they'll go to these three references. Be careful. I did a debate last, last Sunday at Speaker's Corner actually two Sundays ago at Speaker's Corner, I don't know if any of you were there, uh, and I was debating this very subject, is Muhammad found in our Bible? And I thought the gentleman was gonna stick to these three references. He did his homework, he was, a good, he was terrific, he knew exactly that I was gonna zero in on it. It was, uh, Deuteronomy 18, Song of Solomon 5, 16, and John 14 and John 16. And I'll show you how you can answer this. He didn't deal with any of those three verses, he went through a whole litany of new verses, all of which made no sense, all of which were desperate. Desperation personified. It was obvious that he did not know and he could not use any other references. They're striving hard and bless their hearts. They're looking anywhere to find any reference to Muhammad in our Bible. Because if there's no reference to Muhammad in our Bible, then they've got to throw out Surah 7, 157 and Surah 61, Ayah 2, which stipulates that you will find references to the Prophet in the earlier scriptures, in the Taurat and the Injil, in the books of Moses and the Injil, the, the reference to the books of Jesus. Obviously, we know them as the Gospels. 
So you can see the difficulty with that. You cannot find this prophet there in our scriptures. Let's go to the second pillar. The second pillar is the Salat. Now the Salat are those prayers that they do five times a day, right? We know it's five. Is there anybody that disputes that? Are there more than five? Are there less than five? Open up your Qurans and see if you can find five prayers in the Quran. How many of you tried to do that? None of you, don't, I wouldn't expect you. You have tried to. Have you found five prayers in the Quran? No. There are six different times that the Salat is referred to in the Quran and every time, every time you will find the Fajr, the Maghrib, and the Zul, which we're gonna talk about in just a little bit. You'll only find three prayers in the Quran. That's all you will find. Now isn't that curious? Every Muslim knows that they're to pray five times a day. So why is it in Surahs 1778, you'll find the Fajr, which is the morning prayer, and the Maghrib, which is the evening prayer, the beginning and the end of the day. And then it's not then until you get to the Surah 2, Ayah 238, which is a Medinan Surah, a later Surah, that which was revealed to the Prophet in the last 10 years of his life, or that you get the Zur, which is the midday prayer. So you have the morning Fajr, the Zur in the afternoon, and the Maghrib in the evening. Very simple, one, two, three. See, the problem is, all you're missing two prayers, aren't you? There should be all five prayers there. Where are they? I challenge Muslims all the time. Show me those two prayers. You're missing the last two prayers, the one that comes after Maghrib and before midnight. You can't find them. They're not in the Quran. So who prayed three times a day? Well, the Jews prayed three times a day. So basically what you have here is a borrowing from Judaism, which is interesting because a lot of Islam has borrowed from Judaism. We'll see that more and more, especially next week. Here's another problem. Can you see the difficulty? Here they found out that the Jews were praying three times a day and probably they shouldn't have been surprised since they borrowed it anyways. The Jews prayed three times a day, so it's obvious they couldn't do what the Jews did, so they added another two prayers, but when were those other two prayers added? Those other two prayers were not added until Al-Buhari in the ninth century, until the Hadith were finally compiled by Al-Buhari, who died in 870. Can you see this last two prayers, the Isa and the Asar, which actually, it's, well, one is put before the Maghrib and the other is put after the Maghrib, late afternoon and before midnight. These the two prayers were then added a good 200 to 250 years after Muhammad died. Is that not curious to any of you? It should be. And it should cause you an awful lot of concern, especially if you have Muslim friends, because this starts to suggest that much of what we know of the practices of Islam did not exist at the time of Muhammad. These were added much later. And of course, if they're not there at the time of Muhammad, something as important as five prayers you need to ask your Muslim friends whether or not, therefore, they really exist or they are part of Islam. So you have the prayers, the salat, five times a day. And then when you look at the prayers, you can see how exactly how they go through. Now we have a little lad up here who's showing you how it's done. You have the Allahu Akbar with the hands behind the ears, followed by the Fatiha, where he puts his hands down at his, at his waist. The Ruku, where he bends over to his knees. The Sujud, where he goes down and, and he hits his forehead uh, or leaves his forehead on, uh, on the floor. And then he comes up to the Jalsa, which would be coming back on his haunches. And that is one Raga, when they do that, those uh, five different steps. The Allahu Akbar, Fatiha, the Ruku, Sujud, and the Jalsa. Now, many of you have probably seen older men uh, with scars on their head or calluses on their forehead. And these are worn with pride and they will point them out to you if you don't uh, take a look at them. Uh, many Muslims uh, love to show off their, their calluses that have been uh, accumulated over the years from hitting their head on the floor doing the sujud. Fascinating, a lot of my friends when they come up to me, they want to make sure, sometimes they even put my hand up there to feel it, to see how calloused it is, proving how religious they are. Fascinating, isn't it? That's a lot of prayers, wasted prayers. Because what do they do when they're doing these five different acts? Anybody know? Basically, they do the same thing they do every day. The same five things. Doing that raka, one after the other. Now, there are many occasions they have to do it. Uh, they do it all, all uh, certainly after, they, um, after they've uh, Friday prayers. They do it uh, during, during, during Eid. 
the Eid al-Fitr and uh, uh, during Ramadan, right through Ramadan, Eid al-Adha, the feast that comes afterwards. Uh, they do it when they're at a funeral, when they're traveling during the eclipse, uh, during the time for calling for rain, what they all call istika, and the tajhud, the night vigil. So there are many times that these prayers are done, not just the five times that, we, that are allocated for every day. They must, before they do their prayers, they must be ritually clean. So they have, they go to a faucet, many of your mosques, if you have a chance to go into a mosque, you will see the, the ablution faucets that are right there near the prayer room, uh, where they start by washing their hands, their mouth, their nose, their face, their forearms, their hair, the ears, and then finally their feet. And then they, then only then are they ritually clean to then go and do the prayers. Often when I go to uh, see my friends, if I come into their house, Immediately, they'll just stop what they're doing after they've uh, given, me, given the salutation and they do their prayers right in front of me. And you'll wonder why, if this is the time of prayer, and you'll excuse yourself, it's not the time of prayer, but they do it purposely because this gives them extra barakah. Uh, they remember that angel that's on their right shoulder that's recording all their good deeds. They get better deeds for doing this. So don't be surprised if they do that when you go to visit their homes. Quite normal. Because they must do it in front of unbelievers, especially those uh, for, uh, who, have, who are seekers, as they think most of you would be, uh, because this is part of their dahwa. Dahwa means their invitation to Islam. Now, they always must do their prayers in one direction. And you all know this, it's all towards Mecca. And every Muslim must know where Mecca is, no matter where they are. And that's why you will find that in every mosque there is a special wall with a little... Uh, enclosure or a little uh, niche that's put into the wall called the Makhrib. Uh, and it's, that is the direction of Mecca for that particular mosque. Some of the churches here in this city have been bought by Muslims. I don't know if any of you have been to any of these churches that have been made into mosques. I went to one in Collingdale, and I remember the imam took me around to show me what they had done to this church. They had stripped all the pews out. They had taken off that beautiful... Uh, stained glass windows and they put mats on the floor instead of pews and they put plexiglass in where the stained glass windows had been. Stripped the place naked. And then when I went in to look at the, the mosque, my imam friend showed me, see Mr. Smith, you used to pray in this direction. We now pray in that direction. Backwards and over to the right. We have now put the mihrab where it belongs. This is the proper place that it should have been from the very beginning. And you know, he was, I could see what he was doing. It was like he was slapping me in the face verbally. It was a, basically, it was a one-upmanship, and it's very much a part of their plan to do just that with many of our churches, or as many of the churches as they can get. Because it's so important for them that they redirect that prayer back to Mecca, back to the place that they are obeyed, that they must, they must pray towards. The beauty is we can pray in any direction we want, can't we? We don't have to pray in one direction. When we pray tonight, and when we prayed at the very beginning, which way did we pray? In every direction. Which seems to suggest that their God could only be heard in one place. <laughs> Whereas our God can be heard everywhere. Isn't it great? Isn't it terrific to have that freedom? And to know that our God is omnipresent. To know that we can pray to him more than just five times a day. We can pray to him continuously. That's the beauty of what, who our God is. And the fact that he doesn't demand that we go to him, he demands he comes down to us, enters into our presence, listens to us, and he's right here, even as we're praying. Now, Mecca, obviously, is the place, and we're going to talk more about Mecca next week, and you'll see some disturbing things about Mecca. I'm not going to tell you right now, I'm just whetting your appetite, because so next week we're going to start unplug, uh, un, uh, un, unwrapping an awful lot of problems with the prayer, an awful lot of problems with who it, what Mecca is, well, what it was historically and what, of course, what it is today. When they um, do the prayers, they have a muezzin that gets up on a minaret and calls that call to prayer. Now, they're not permitted to do it in London because of the restrictions that they have here. But in many of your Muslim lands, if you go there, you will hear this prayer, six o'clock in the morning, or certainly in the afternoon, the evening, it'll wake you up, especially when during Ramadan. And uh, it, it was first created or begun by, interestingly, a slave named Bilal, a black slave named Bilal, who then was given his freedom so that he could continue the, as a muezzin, because he had a beautiful voice. And he was the first muezzin used by Muhammad as basically the, the, para, uh, the, the paradigm for, for uh, the call to prayer. Now, that's the five prayers that I've been talking about that all Muslims must do. There is another kind of prayer called dua. 
Dua is an interesting prayer because that is a private prayer that every Muslim can say. And what Muslims are doing, and this is fascinating, they are taking Dua and they're trying to impose it onto Salat. Dua can be done at any time and there's, basically you can do it in any direction. It's not the ritual or ceremony prayer, it's not the one that you're uh, obliged to do five times a day, so you can do it all at any time. And it's a prayer of supplication. The difficulty is that Muslims don't know how to defend it and they don't know how to define it. It's, they're finding a difficult time trying to understand it. And I like to use it, and I say, you know, your dua, that which you look as dua, is actually similar to the kind of prayer that I do. Use it as a bridge to open up your conversation with Muslims, because you will find that most Muslims can understand what you're talking about if you say, we pray like you do in dua. But when we pray, God answers our prayers. Does he answer your prayers? Ooh, tu -tu -tu -tu, that's a good one to ask them. So you've got them in a jam here, because if they say, yes, he answers my prayers, then you say, well, then that's fascinating. So God, God is responsive to you as a slave. God, therefore, can, has to, uh, um, basically has to answer your prayers. That tells me that your God is limited. Immediately, they see the problem they're in. They cannot say that about God. How can a slave stipulate that a master may listen to them or respond to them? Remember what we were talking about yesterday. They are nothing more than abids. Abids means slave of God. They are slaves of God who cannot demand anything of God because God's above any demand. So prayer, dua, supposes that God has to listen to them. God has to respond to them. We know God does that all the time. That's why we pray, isn't it? That's a great bridge to help them to help them understand exactly what the gospel says about prayer. Bring them in to that God that does answer that prayer, to that God that wants to answer that prayer, the God that wants to come alongside them, the God that wants to respond to them. Let's then go to Psalm or Ramadan. The Psalm, which is the fast they do once a year. They do it in community, uh, in communion together. In Surah 2, Ayah 183 to 187, uh, speaks about the fast. It's uh, on the ninth month, the same day as we find in Judaism as Ashura, uh, the Jewish Day of Atonement. It's not the normal month that we have. It's a lunar month, so it changes. It's a... It's a, it's a smaller month than is normal in our calendar and, it, and that's why every year the fast moves up about 11 to 12 sometimes 14 days a year and it's moving forward as we go uh, because they do follow the lunar calendar uh, it, commen it commences usually at the beginning uh, of the day a, an imam will go outside and he'll hold a black and white thread up and when he can start seeing which is white and which is black outside, at that time, when he sees the distinction between the two colors, he then calls the muezzin, the muezzin then calls the prayer, and then, of course, the, big, the Muslims start their fast. They no longer can eat. Sometimes they cannot drink. Sometimes they cannot even swallow their own spittle. They're not to have any sexual relations during the day while they're fasting. And then in the evening, again, when the sun is setting and it's starting to get dusk outside, they'll, the imam will go back out again hold the white and black thread up together and uh, try to distinguish which is which and when he, can see, when he can no longer see the difference between the two, he then calls the muezzin. The muezzin calls to prayer, they eat their dates, they drink their very strong ataya chi tea and then they feast for the whole evening. And they eat more during that time than they do all, if they were to eat all day long. In fact, they eat more in that month than all the other 11 months put together. Well, not put together, but certainly more than those other months. And it's a time of feasting rather than fasting, ironically. They just move the times to the evenings. And so they eat an awful lot after the fast. They continue to eat through the evenings. And it's a time of solidarity. It's fascinating. Uh, when you get close to your Muslim friends, you will find that an awful lot of them have a strong sense of identity during the time of Ramadan fast. Why? Because they've done something together that's difficult. And if you know, most, uh, if you know anything about Muslim lands, most of the Muslim lands are in that 1040 window, the, the 10th and the 40th parallel, that area of the world that is not only the poorest part of the world, but also the driest, the hottest, closest to the equator. And so as a result of that, it's a very difficult place to fast. I lived in Senegal for five years, and I did the fast with my Senegalese friends, and we live right there on the border of the Sahara Desert, and it was difficult. It was hard to go through a whole day of 100 degree uh, Fahrenheit, 40, 45 degree centigrade weather, no cloud in the sky, and he just dreamed of water fountains and streams, and oh, I just couldn't wait till the fast ended. And having finished the fast, then you feasted with all your friends because you were rejoicing that you made it through that fast, and there's a sense of having gone through a real battle together. We don't have anything equivalent to it in Christianity. I wish we did. I wish we had something as difficult as that. 
because it really does bring them together. And I find when we engage in discussion with our Muslim friends at Speaker's Corner, during the fast is when you get your best discussions. Usually, sometimes not always, but usually you get your best discussions because Muslims are much more religious during that time. They come together much more so, and that's why there's so many times around the world when there are difficulties, there have riots. Well, there are also dire consequences too. In Senegal, they wouldn't let anybody who is a Muslim drive the trains during the Ramadan fast because they had so many accidents, because they went to sleep at the wheels. And the same thing is on the road. You pretty well know that there can be a lot more accidents during the Ramadan period because they just go to sleep. It's very difficult to stay awake when you're fasting and in a very hot, hot environment like Muslim lands are. No swallowing, one saliva, I mean, it goes on and on. Now, you need to compare the fast that they have in Ramadan with what we have in the Bible. And probably the best chapter to go to is Isaiah 58. Because there you see the difference between the two fasts. Muslims fast because they're told to do it. Muslims fast because they're obeying, because they're submitting, because they're getting that blessing that God is giving them or that the angel is recording in, on the shoulder. So it's a totally different view of fasting than what we have as Christians. As Christians, we fast because something needs to be settled in our lives. Something needs to be rectified. And that's why we fast. And so we fast at any time, not just one period, not just with everybody else. Sometimes you do it as a group, yes. Sometimes you do it as a church, yes. But usually you do it individually and you do it with prayer and fasting because we know that when we fast and when we pray, that which is a crisis in our life, that which is going wrong in our life, will be rectified because God honors those fasts. There's a relational aspect to fasting, isn't there? Like we said last week. To understand that Isaiah 58 is a good chapter to go to because it shows the purpose for fasting, it shows the outcome of fasting, and it really gives the relational aspect that it is involved in fasting, where we relate to God in our fast, and because of that, that which is, needs to be rectified gets changed, and we come closer to God because of the fast, something that is completely missed with Muslims. The fourth pillar, then, is the zakat, the tithing. So they tithe much like we do, but whereas we tithe 10%, they only tithe 2.5%. No, oh, okay, so they don't tithe as, tithe as much. Can be given with cash, jewelry, um, savings. Usually you give it to the mosque or the, the, the imam or the peer or the sheikh or whoever it is that's responsible for retaining it. That supposedly should be given to the poor, the destitute, the collectors, the travelers, the mujahideen, those who are part of the, uh, those who are part of the, of the defenders of the faith and those who are in bondage. Now, interestingly, Muslims always say to me, you know, you don't have to do the zakat, so therefore you get off much easier than we do. And I always correct them and say, no, stop and think. When the prophet was living, when he actually controlled Medina, and when he took over uh, Tabuk in the north, and if we went up to Khaybar further up, and we, when he came and controlled many of the Jews and the Christians living in those two towns, he imposed dhimi laws, or Dimi laws are laws that were imposed on people that were, that were bonded, people that were, uh, that were kept by the Muslims. And they would include the people of the book, which would include us, Christians, and the Jews, and interestingly, the Zoroastrians. Why the Zoroastrians? Nobody can tell me. But those are the three groups that are included as the Ali Kitab, the people of the book. The people of the book do not have to pay the zakat, but what we do have to pay are other taxes called jizya tax and qaraj tax. Jizya tax is a tax on all our goods, and kharaj tax is a tax on all our land, whatever land we owned. And if you add the two taxes up together, it can be anywhere from 15% up to 20%. It is such an imposing uh, imposition, uh, it was such an imposition on Christians and Jews in the seventh century that an enormous number of Christians became Muslims so they wouldn't have to pay the kharaj and jizya tax. And if Muslims were to come, and of course, if they were to take over Britain, these taxes would be imposed on us under Islamic law, the Kharaj and the Jizya tax, because we would be seen as people of the book. The people who are outside of that have to pay even higher taxes, obviously, and there's an enormous amount of stipulations for them that we won't go into tonight. The last pillar is the Hajj. And we'll spend a little bit more time on this one because this is probably the one that's, probably, that's proving to be most interesting. The Hajj is what the Muslims must do once in their lifetime. Now, there are basically six days to the Hajj. And I don't think anybody in here has done the Hajj unless you used to be a Muslim because you're not permitted to do a Hajj. And don't try. 
Uh, because it's not very pleasant if they find out. There have been some notorious cases of people who've tried to go in and take pictures or try even one or two adventurous Englishmen who have gone through and done the Hajj just to write about it and some of them have not uh, come out. But basically what you do, you go through six different days. And there's, the first day is, of course, at Mecca itself. And at Mecca is this very small little building called the, called the Kaaba. You've all seen pictures of it. Um, it's, it's one of these curious buildings that has a silver uh, frame, and inside the frame is a black stone in the northeast corner. Maybe you've seen pictures of it as well. Now, Muslims cannot, help, cannot uh, uh, explain what that stone is doing in the northeast corner. I've never seen a Muslim that can explain that stone. Most scholars believe it's a, it was a meteorite that was probably put there back in, before the seventh century. We'll get back to that. But the Kaaba is the place that they first go to that first day. And the first day, then they circumambulate seven times around the Kaaba. Why seven times? Hold on to that. They do the dua and the raka prayers. They do the private prayers, and then they do the raka prayers, which is the, f the prayers of the, using those five different formula that we saw earlier. And if you look at the map up here, just to take a look and see where they go to. Now, can you see where Mecca is there, that, that yellow, yellow, yellow buildings, those yellow... Uh, interesting designs. That's Mecca, and you can see where the Kaaba is right in the center. That's where they do the seven circumambulations, and then the same day, that first day, they, get, they then go and they run between two hills called the Safa and the Marwa hills on both sides. After that, they then go out to the Mina, uh, Mina, which is a big plain, and they stay overnight at Mina that first night. The second day, they then go to Muzdalifa, and they go beyond Muzdalifa all the way to the plain of Arafat. And at the plain of Arafat, they then uh, do their prayers under the Mount of Mercy, um, which is a big mountain. We'll see pictures of it later, so you'll see what I'm talking about. Once they come back from that, from the plain of uh, Mount of Mercy, they come back to the plain of Muzdalifa, and they stay the second night there after having done prayers. While they're at Muzdalifa, they then pick up stones, and they should pick up about 49 to 70 stones, which means there should be a lot of stones there, because sometimes as many as two million people go every year to and do this ritual. On the third day, then, they take those stones, and they go back to Mina, and then they start tossing these stones at these three pillars, supposedly three devils. And they have to toss first seven at a time, or seven stones. Then the fourth, fifth, and sixth day, they then stay there at Mina, and every day they get up and they throw seven more stones at those devils. And then the last day, the sixth day, they go back to Mecca and do a circumambulation uh, seven times around again before they head on back home. So that's the process. I don't think any of you need to worry about doing it. I hope you don't have to do it. Uh, let's note, make sure you don't. Here's some pictures of, of the, uh, the, the Sai, they call it, where they go back and forth seven times. There's that number seven again between the Safa and the Marwa hills. And you can see it's a long corridor. Some people, they're supposed to run because, because there's such huge crowds, they have to walk these days. There's the second day where they go back to, out to the Mount of Mercy. And there you can see the stone at the top uh, where they do their prayers. And then they come back to the Mina plain and then they start throwing their stones. They start throwing their stones at these towers. And you've probably heard many stories about people who are near the stones getting hit with the stones and being killed. Every year people get killed. Because people who can't get close, they just throw their stones and they don't, they're not their greatest shots. And they hit the people in front. And that's why you can notice some people have umbrellas up <laughs> to protect themselves. Now, it's fascinating because when you look at these, you have to ask yourself, what's the significance? What's going on here? The last four to six days, they then stay at Mina do the seven uh, stones again, and then they go and do their circumambulation back to the mosque, to the, uh, the central part where the Kaaba is. That's an old picture there of what the Kaaba looks like. Just take a look at the masses of people that attend. Just look at those numbers. Can you see it up there? Look at those buses they have up in the upper left-hand corner. Look at the tent city they have in the lower right-hand corner. And then take a look at them praying on the left. That's, those are all people praying. Millions of them every year praying, and there is what the, the Kaaba looks like today. <clears throat> it's a much larger building, it's huge. It can be seen from space by, by the space station, and of course, as you can imagine, it all centers on that little black building. That's the Kaaba.
That's the building, supposedly. That's the place, supposedly, that Adam and Eve were sent to when they were thrown out of paradise. They were thrown down to the earth and they were thrown down to that place where the Gaba is. So it's the oldest spot on earth for civilization. It's the first place that humanity ever came to, according to Islam. But here's the questions. What's the significance of that black stone to begin with? Ask your Muslim friends that. Most Muslims will say there is no significance. Yet there's so many of them that try to kiss it, or try to rub it, or try to touch it. And so much so that it's, they've stopped it now because it's now wearing away the stone. But obviously it was put there for a reason. Something as important as the Kaaba. You don't desecrate the Kaaba by adding something to it. That's the first curiosity. Why seven times around the Kaaba? What's with the number seven? Well, what do we know about the number seven? It's the perfect number, isn't it? That comes out of Judaism. Here's another borrowing that's come out of Judaism, the number seven. And then why do they run back and forth between the Safa and Marwa hills? Ask your Muslim friends this, those who have done the Hajj, or those who know about it. This is all done on the first day. Why do they run back and forth? What we do know about the Safa and the Marwa hills is that these are the two hills that when Ishmael and uh, Hagar were thrown out of Abraham's presence, when Abraham threw them out, they went to the desert, they came down to Mecca, supposedly, and she w they didn't have any water. So she went looking for water, and so she went to one hill, ran to that hill, and that was the Safa hill. There was no water there. So then she ran back to another hill, the other direction, and that was the Marwa hill. And there was no water there. And then she came back to her son Ishmael. And where he has been sitting, waiting for her, suddenly the water bubbled up out of the sand. And that area where now the water bubbled up is now become the Zamzam well, which every Muslim goes to. Uh, and of course, they want to take a sip of water from that well. So the question I ask is, why then do they honor the two things that were failures? Is there something not else? Is there something else that has been borrowed? Keep that under your hat a minute. And then when they come back to the Mina, or when they come to Muzdalafa, uh, uh, when they come back to that plain, why do they pick up 49 stones? Well, that's a multiple of seven, or 70. There's another multiple of seven. See that number seven coming in all the time. Why do they pick up these multiple of seven stones, bring them back to these three pillars, these three devils? How many devils are there in the Quran? There's only one. So why three devils? I've never heard a Muslim that can understand, that help me with that one. I've asked hundreds, tell me, why do you throw at three different pillars? Why not just one pillar? Does this not suggest to you a pre-Islamic pagan ritual or pagan orig origins? And what we're gonna see next week is that much of Islam has been barred from other sources, including these rituals. These have all been barred either from Judaism or they've been borrowed from these pagan rituals that did exist in Mecca, and we're not going to know what Mecca is until next week. We're going to have to wait on that. I'm not going to tell you. But I want you to just to hear that, to know that, because we're going to come back, and we're going to show you that a good bit, a lot of Islam is not new. There's not much unique about Islam. It's nothing more than borrowings. Thank God we don't have these problems. Thank God when Muslims ask us questions about what we do and why we do it, we have answers. Thank God I don't have to defend those kind of rituals. Now, the first belief that all Muslims must believe is, of course, belief in God. And uh, we've talked about God quite a bit. We've talked about Allah. Last week, we did a comparison looking at Allah on one side versus Yahweh on the other. Or as I said, over you people on the side were the Muslims. You believed in Allah. You on this side were the Christians. Thank God you believed in Yahweh. And we got you depressed and you got really excited. And I think... The reason is very simple. The God on this side was a God that is personal. The God on this side is a God that comes to earth. The God on this side is the one that walks and talks in the cool of the day, as we saw there in Genesis 3, verse 8 and 9. Whereas the God on this side, Allah, is very distant, totally other, never comes to earth, always stays in heaven. Though there are a few scriptures that seem to not only suggest that he does come to earth, but contradict that very notion that he always stays in heaven, such as Surah 20, Ayah 10 to 14, 
where Allah is in the burning bush when Moses comes up to investigate the burning bush. There is Allah in the bush speaking to Moses, saying, take off your shoes. This is Allah who is speaking to you, suggesting Allah does come to earth. A great bridge that you can help Muslims, because if they have this theology that God must stay, stay totally distant, what are they going to do with Surah 20, Ayah 10 to 14? Or Surah 50, Ayah 16, which also suggests that Allah, the spirit of Allah, the Ru, much like our Ruha in uh, Hebrew, that Ru of Allah, the Arabic name for spirit, is as close to you as your juggler vein. He's as close to us as where we are stand right here or where we're sitting. Suggesting a duality that God is both there and here simultaneously. And when they ask you that question, as they will ask you, if you believe God is personal, if you God believe Jesus is God, if Jesus is God and he was on earth and he was running the universe while he was on earth, just throw back to them, well, if Allah is God and he's there talking with Moses there in the burning bush, who's running the universe? Ha <laughs> ha, got you, bingo. Or if Allah is his spirit and he is there as close to your juggler vein, you've got the same problem. God is here and he is there simultaneously. Thank God we don't have that problem. We know God is perfectly able to be everywhere at once because not only is he omnipresent, he is three in one. And that's the beauty of it. Now they'll say, well, that three in one causes a lot of confusion. And we saw last week how they don't know what to do with the triune nature of God. And they say, where is that word in your Bible? And I'll look and I'll say, where is the word that you use to define your God, Tawheed, which is the word they use, his one, Tawheed. Where is that word in the Quran? Aha, bingo, we got them on that one too. And so it goes on and on if you want to play tit for tat with them on that. We'll show you how you can do it much more efficiently when we come to apologetics and polemics in a few weeks uh, when we get into that section. Now, we need to ask then, who is this Allah? If he is distant and personal, where does that name originate? Now, there's been lots of studies trying to unpack that name. Basically, the name itself, the God, is all it means. The God, Allah, the God. It's a generic name. Any God can be called the God, just like G-O-D in English is the God. And so it has lots of former antecedents. What we do know is that there is now historical studies trying to look and find out where it is documented earlier than the 7th century. And there is references to Allah as far back as the 4th century AD. That means good two to 300 years before the time that Muhammad lived. And it's interesting because in the, in the references that they have found on Allah there in those uh, documents, they find that Allah has a father named Hubal and three daughters named Alat, Al-Manat, and Al-Uzza which means Allah is a pantheon of gods. Now, is not Allah one God? Is not, not, not their, isn't that their statement of faith? For there is no God but God? But if they say there is no God but God, what about his daddy, Hubal? And what about his three daughters, Alat, Al-Manat, and Al-Uzza? Can you see there's a problem here? What's more, if you all know that famous book that was written by Salman Rushdie, the Satanic Verses, remember that? Satanic verses are referring to basically a set of verses that do exist in the Quran in Surah 53, Ayah 19 and 20. Those are the satanic verses. These are the verses that supposedly, according to tradition, that were revealed to the prophet when he was living in Mecca. And they are verses about these three goddesses, these three female goddesses that were existing or that were there in the Kaaba, that they were being worshipped by the Quraysh, the people who lived there in Mecca. Uh, when Muhammad moved up to Medina in 622, Supposedly, the angel Gabriel came to Muhammad and said, why did you put those three verses in? Why did you put those references to those three goddesses in? You must expunge them. It was Satan that seduced you. These are satanic verses. So Muhammad expunged the reference, references to goddesses, but left the names there. So you can open up the Quran today, go to Surah 19, I'm sorry, 53, to 9, verse 19 to 20, and you will see the references to these three goddesses, Alat, Al-Manat, and Al-Uzza, which are pagan goddesses who are the daughters of Allah, the son of Hubal. Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Now I leave that for you to discuss with your Muslim friends, see how they get out of that. But can you see, there's, these are damaging because they seem to suggest to me that here's another borrowing from pagan sources. Could those then be the three towers that they're throwing stones at? Ah, put it together. There's an awful lot of research that needs to be done here, folks. And if you want to do some doctorates, we have lots of material that you can look at. We need to start deciphering and looking at it and then coming to conclusions. We know that Yahweh does not have this problem. We don't have to worry about our historical antecedents. 
People have tried to say that Yahweh did not exist before the first century. I'll take you down to the British Museum and you can go up to the upper floor into the Mesopotamian room and you will see a piece of pottery shard that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in the sixth century BC with the name Yahweh on it. It's a prayer by a Jew to their God, Yahweh. Yaha, Waha, the four, the four letters. This is a good, this is, oh my goodness, this is a good thousand years before Alaim came into existence. Isn't it great that we have the eternal God? Isn't it good that we don't have to, isn't it great that we don't have to apologize for Yahweh? And isn't it good that even the rocks are crying out his name, though we may keep quiet? That's the beauty of standing for a God that we know is historical, a God that has always been, will continue to be, and because it's this name that we want to now introduce to the world, this imminent God, this God that is personal, this God that does come down and walk and talk with us. What a great God. So, the next question is, should we use the name Allah? This is an ongoing question, especially within Arab circles, Arab Christian circles. I'm sure there are some Arab Christians who are here tonight who use the name Allah, and have been, and will continue to do so. If you open up the Arabic Bible, you will see the name Allah for God in the references there. What are we gonna do with this name Allah? Well, there are many pros and cons to this argument. Uh, uh, for, uh, to, uh, for those who want to continue to use the name, especially Christian Arabs, they say well, they need to use it because it's the name they have used for the millennia. It's been in the Bible all these years. They would say that every culture uses their own particular name for God. Kami is what we use in Japan. G-O-D is what we use in English. I see there are many nationalities here. I'm sure you all have your different names in your Bible, your translations, that are not Yahweh. And so we adopt these different names to delineate what the different references for God. So why not continue to use Allah since that is the name that has been given. That is the name that has always been understood. That is the name that was really basically imposed by the Muslims for the last 1400 years. Against that argument is that it brings a confusion concerning who, is, who God is. And if you're gonna use the name Allah, you're gonna to have to define what Allah you're talking about. The Allah of history or the Allah of the Bible? The Allah that Muslims have adopted, and here's the difficulty because Muslims now are adopting that name as an identity marker, much like the hijab is becoming an identity marker for women in the West. So the name Allah is becoming an identity marker in the West. And you will see this more and more. The name Allah now is significant, is uniquely now being uh, imposed on the Muslim God, the God that we find in the Quran, and the God that the Prophet Muhammad introduced. So there's the difficulty. It may be in time that we will not be able to use that name. Places like Malaysia today, in the country of Malaysia, nobody could, but Muslims can use that name. Christians can no longer use the name Allah. And that may be a case uh, as we go on. I don't mind, and as far as I'm concerned, I don't mind going back to Yahweh. It's such a great name. And it's the name that Moses was satisfied with. And it's the name that God said to Moses, this will be my name forever. He's a jealous God, he's jealous of his name. It was such a holy name that not even the Jews would pronounce it. That's why we don't know whether, how to pronounce it today. Is it Yahweh or is it Jehovah? Certainly what I do know and what I think is important is that we need to certainly put, if we're gonna use the name Allah, we need to make sure, define who Allah is. He is not the Muslim God, not the God that's over here, not that God that stays distant, not that God that has nothing to do with me, certainly not that God that imposes all these rules, regulations, and institutions. Oh, God on this side, he comes down, walks and talks. Thank God for that. Thank God he does do that. It's totally two different gods. So what, was, what is usually is a solution is that when you're working in the West, here in Britain, we try not to use the name Allah because it causes confusion. But when you're in a Muslim environment, when you're in an Arab-speaking environment, maybe that's a better way to put it, not Muslim environment, but an Arab-speaking environment, then you may have no other choice but to use Allah. But make sure you define what Allah means. All right? And that's the mythological answer. It's a cop-out, I know. But I think in soon in time, we probably won't be able to do that anymore. The second belief for all Muslims is the belief of prophets. They believe that there are 124,000 prophets. Don't ask them to name them all. They'll spend spending all day and they'll only get around to about 24 of them. That's about all that they know because those are the only ones that are listed in the Quran. 24, possibly 25. Of the 24, 25 references to the prophets in the Quran, four of them we don't know at all. We have no idea who they are. 
They could be Zoroastrian prophets. We need to do some homework. It'd be great for someone to do a study on that, to try to uh, link and try to do some documentary analysis, do some source criticism on where these names came from, where they were borrowed from. One of them we know is Muhammad. And the other 19 are all biblical prophets. They're all found in our Bibles. Names like Ibrahim, Abraham, Moise, Moses, Yahya, John the Baptist, Dauda, David, Issa, Jesus. These are names you do know. The difficulty is when you look at their stories, they're not the same stories that we have in the Bible. Amazing how different they are. The stories don't make sense. Oh, they're entertaining, they're fun to read, but they don't make much sense. They don't take you anywhere, they don't lead you anywhere. And as a result, you're sitting there wondering, where is the content? Where do these stories come from? They don't begin, they don't end. They just slap in the middle of another story that has nothing to do with the first story. And you're confused as to know, what are these prophets doing? At times, they contradict each other. We'll talk more about that next week. We do know of the great prophets, though. <clears throat> Ibrahim, Moise, Dauda, Issa, and Muhammad are, the, are the, the five great prophets. And they are the ones they are given revelation, which we'll talk about next. But what's interesting is when you look at the stories in the traditions on the prophets, when you look and see what their stories say, they follow a certain formula. They follow a certain pattern. Every one of the prophets follow the same pattern. They are commissioned by God. They confront their people. They are rejected by the people. The people are destroyed, and the prophet is therefore then saved. In almost every prophet, you find that same formula, suggesting again that these are borrowed from other sources. Basically, one story that is then just given the same name, but given different, different situations with the same, same formula story. And as we talked about earlier, every one of these prophets doesn't, has to follow in, under that uh, rubric as to what is a true prophet. The third belief, then, is the belief in the books. And these are the books that every prophet must uh, give. I mean, every prophet is, has a a job has a responsibility and their responsibility is to receive a revelation they are nothing more than messengers they are arbiters they are intermediaries that take that message and they disseminate it to the world usually writing it down and so you have the Taurat which would be the, the reference uh, this book that Moses was given the Zabur which is the books that David was given Dauda was given the Injil the book that Jesus was given and the Quran the book that Muhammad was given. Where are the other 121,000, uh, no, 123,996 books? I don't know. Don't ask Muslims, they don't know where they are. They've all been lost. Those are the only uh, four books that are retained today. Now, the difficulty is Muslims don't agree that these are the original books. They'll say right off the top, and I'm sure you've all heard this, that all these books have been corrupted. So the Taurat has been corrupted, the Zabur has been corrupted, the Injil has been corrupted. In fact, who, where is the Injil of Jesus? You have the Injil of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who are they? They're not Jesus. They're not prophets. So how could that prove that this is not the Injil of Jesus? And they spend much of their time disseminating these four gospels and showing all the myriad of supposed contradictions between them. Listen, don't waste your time on all that. We've done it for you. If you are given a whole list of contradictions between the four gospels, uh, there's a great book that's been put out there called 101 Clear Contradictions of the Bible. We have gone through and taken every one of those 101 clear contradictions of the Bible, and we put 101 cleared up contradictions of the Bible. We've cleared them all up for you. And you can go up online, and we'll probably will put it on the CD, uh, the DVD that we're going to uh, have available at the end of this course. This uh, 101 cleared up contradictions that takes every one of their accusations and gives an answer for them. They're easy. Basically, they make the same 15 mistakes all the way through. Sometimes they just don't understand the context of the verse they're looking at. Sometimes they don't just read the verse after or the verse before. Other times they misunderstood what the author is saying. A lot of times they don't understand the Hebrew or the Greek. And it's the same mistakes over and over and over again. Every one of these can be, can, uh, can be answered. That's why it's lovely that we have answers for almost everything they throw at us. And if we don't have an answer, give me a week, and we will within one week. That's the lovely thing about this kind of exercise. And that's why we can help you, because this work has already been done. Don't feel that you have to reinvent the wheel. Now, they believe that all the books should be saying the same thing, and this is the difficulty. That's why... You, when you look at the books itself, you will see they don't say the same thing. They all agree with each other, but they don't talk about the same stories for one very good reason. The Old Testament deals with Old Testament themes, deals with Old Testament history. The New Testament deals with the person of Jesus Christ and what he came and what he said. 
you can see immediately that you're not going to have the same reference and same material as what the Quran says, which says very little about Jesus Christ. There's only about 73 references to him in the Quran. There is the difficulty. And of course, the real problem is the book itself, the word of God, the Kalimatu as they call it in Surah 85, 22, is that eternal tablet from which the Quran came, that eternal tablet from which the Quran came, suppose and suggest, therefore, that the Kalimatu, the word of God, coexists with God, which creates a duality. Ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo. We'll talk about that in about three weeks as to how you can really take that one apart. That's fun, but that's later. There are a number of uh, problems also with the Quran itself. Now, next week, I'm really going to zero in on this, and we're really going to take this apart, because this is one of, the, my, one of the areas that I love the most. It's fun to look at the Quran and to realize much of the claim, many of the claims, and they make a lot of claims about the Quran, can be disputed. And we're going to do that next week. We're going to show you how you can do it. We're going to show you how you can take each one of their claims, the fact that it's inimitable, the fact that it has no error, the fact that it has no contradictions, the fact that it's unique in the world, the fact that it has literary perfect, the fact that it is universally applicable, the fact that it has no history, all these claims they make, we're going to unpack for you and show you how you can answer every one of them. You have the right to do so because the same claims could be also imposed on our own Bible and we've been able to answer every one of them. Muslims will not be able to answer these claims. We're going to spend the second half of next, uh, next week just unpacking and looking at specifically the historical problems with the Quran. This is new material that's just coming to light here in Britain and also in Germany and the United States. Amazing stuff that they're finding and we'll help you to understand how you can use that. We're finding that there are not many Original, in fact, there is no original Quran. You'll see this, and we'll show you how, you can, how, that, how that's come to light. There is no original Quran, though Muslims will tell you that the Quran has never changed. Isn't that one of the claims they make? Never changed, they say. What has never changed? There's nothing there to look at to see whether it's changed. Where is that original manuscript? And we'll show you how you can date manuscripts and how we're doing this that right now. We're doing it here in London. What's more is the earliest manuscripts that we've been able to find do not correspond with the Quran that we have in our hand today. And that the Quran itself was finally canonized. You know that word canonized, how the Bible was canonized? Was finally canonized in 1924, less than 100 years ago. Ooh, two, 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 two. We look at our Bible, it was canonized in the fourth century. And the Bible hasn't changed. We have manuscript evidence, a whole litany of manuscript evidence that, we can, that supports our Bible. We put together a tour here of the British Museum, going to the British Museum and then looking at the British Library, and it's terrific to see all the things that you people have stolen and brought here and put in that building because it's there for us to use. <laughs> and it's just great to see how it supports our Bible. Thank God you stole it. Because had you not done it, we would not have it available today. It would have been lost. It would have been torn up. It would have been destroyed. The fact that it was kept there and the fact that it was kept in safekeeping gives us not only the right but the ability then to look and to come to conclusions. And it's brilliant to see how we can take every one of these questions. We're going to do it next week. Actually, we're going to do it in a few weeks when we look at the Bible and just show you how authoritative our Bible is. Taking every one of these accusations, we have an answer for. Oh, it's beautiful. I love to stand behind the Bible. But I feel sorry for the Quran. They cannot do the same with the Quran. That's why I love to be able to, in this kind of work, it's a win-win situation when you come back to the Bible in Jesus Christ. He always wins, so does his gospel. Now, the fourth belief are the angels. And here's the problem for many Muslims. What are you going to do with these angels? <laughs> they do name a few of them. Jibril is one. Michael comes from the light. Israfil, the angel of resurrection. And Israel, the angel of death. And then you have Iblis, who is the shaitan or Satan. And there are seven references to his sin. But what do you do with these angels? Now, Jibril is probably the most important. He's the one that's more often, most often seen. He's the one that gives and basically reveals the Quran to Muhammad. He's the messenger that actually brings piecemeal over 22 years the Meccan surahs and then the Medinan surahs in those two different cities. He's the one that squeezed Muhammad uh, and said, Akra, so write or recite. Sorry, not write, recite or read. And he says, Ma Akra, I cannot recite. He did that three times. That's Jibril. So he's the most important and he's the most often quoted. And sometimes he's confused with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes Jibril is given the title of the, the Hru the Hru of God, the Holy Spirit of God. So there's a lot of confusion as to who these angels are. Muslims don't know what to do with these angels because they don't belong to God and they don't belong to man. They're somewhere in between, but if they're somewhere in between, that excluded middle gets them all antsy because there's no theology for that excluded middle. If God is up here and man is down here, are they 
heavenly beings or are they earthly beings? Are they created beings or uncreated beings? Then what about these angels that are put on your shoulders? Every one of you got them. I mean, you're talking about millions of them, hundreds of millions of them. If you look at the whole history of humanity, every one of us has one angel on this shoulder and another on this shoulder. You can't see them. They're there. They're just invisible. Where do these angels come from? Ask your Muslim friends. See if they can answer. They don't have a theology to help and to deal with these angels. And then you got the real problem of the jinn. What about these jinn? These beings that are created from fire, that are referred to in Surah 6, and Surah 15, and Surah 34, Surah 38, 46, 29, 55, 33, 39, and 72. Where do they come from? What's their purpose? According to tradition, these jinn, their favorite pastime is to try to hear the Quran being recited in heaven. And so whenever you look up in the sky at nighttime and you see meteorites going across the sky, you know what's happening? Those meteorites are sent by God to chase the jinn away. So every time you see a meteorite going by, you know there's a jinn trying to listen to the Quran being recited in heaven. Which suggests two things, that heaven's pretty close to earth, because those are in our atmosphere, we now know. But secondly, have you noticed that meteorites are always going the same direction when you ever go through a meteor shower? And we pretty well know when we're going to go through a meteor shower because it happens the same time every year. Which means the jinn only want to listen to the Quran being read at that time of the year. <laughs> or you can have fun with Muslims on this one. But ask them, what are these jinn? What are they made from and what is their purpose? Are they demons? No, they're not demons. Are they angelic? No, they're not angelic. Are they in between? Yes, but define them, defend them, who can? Ah, it's fun because you can see these have been added later on and of course they don't deal with the dual, the dual uh, theology of God up here and man down here. That excluded middle which Jesus Christ dealt with all the time when he was on earth dealing with the demons. He cast them out and he destroyed them and the Holy Spirit has power over them. That's why we don't fear them. Muslims have a deep fear of these jinn. Living in Senegal for five years, at nighttime whenever it got sunset, we didn't have street lights there in Ties, the city we lived in. And so nobody would walk out at night because that's when the jinn were out in the streets. And they didn't want to be attacked by these jinn, except us. We were the only ones that go and visit our friends and they were aghast that we would dare to walk uh, on the streets. We say, listen, we have a, we have a much greater uh, authority than you do. We've got the Holy Spirit that protects us. We don't have to worry about those jinn. And it was a great way to preach the gospel. It was a great way to show them that we have something that God has given us that they don't have. And then the belief in predestination. I talked about this last week. I won't get into it in much more detail. This is that idea that God controls everything. Um, that um, in Surah 4, Ayah 60, in Surah 17, Ayah 175, in Surah 25, Ayah 29. He controls your thoughts, He controls what you say and what you do, your actions. And He also leads those astray whom He wills. So he's a very arbitrary God, not a God that really sticks to any rule or regulation. He's not a God you can pin down. And since he has complete control of you, it seems to suggest, therefore, that we have no volition of ourselves. Basically, we're determined, very highly determined. We're nothing more than little puppets or robotons, you might say, controlled by this overarching God. That's why when you hear uh, Muslims make, they make an agreement with you. I found a lot of my Muslim friends, whenever I was making an agreement or when I was having a transaction, uh, financial transaction, they always say, Inshallah, I'll give you the money tomorrow. I say, no, you don't do that. Because if you're saying, if God wills it, it's very, it's very true that God does will that you pay me tomorrow. In fact, if you don't do it, then you're going against God's will. You make sure you're coming here tomorrow. But that's one way that they would get out of many of their contracts. Inshallah, it's not my, my will, it's God's will that I don't pay it tomorrow. Or there's been many instances of Muslims who do not protect themselves against diseases because they don't believe it's God's will. Or we have a real problem when I grew up in India of women who would just cross the street, put their, shar their saris over their head, their shawl kameez, and just walk right onto traffic, believing if it's God's will, so they, he'll get them across the street. And that's the last thing they thought. And it's sad, this idea that God is in so much control that he doesn't even allow many people to get inoculated because they don't think it's God's will they get inoculated. God will protect them if they're to get, if they're to get diseases or not or they're to sleep with that woman or that man. God will protect them from having AIDS. It's God's will. And it's fascinating how they can abuse this idea of God's will. And it has been abused. But the question I ask is, then who's responsible for your guilt? 
See, if it is God's will, if it is he that dictates what you say and what you do and your thoughts, then why is it you're be held responsible for that which you do? Blame God, don't blame you. And this is one of the curiosities that Muslims cannot answer. I've never really heard them respond to that. Now we go on to the last of the beliefs, the belief in the judgment. And this is, as I said last week, this is where they take these good and bad deeds that are recorded on the two shoulders. Good deeds on this shoulder, bad deeds on this shoulder. They take them out and they weigh them on a scale. And hopefully your good deeds outweigh the bad deeds. And if they do, then you have the right to walk across that razor-sharp bridge. And as you're walking across that bridge, Allah can throw you down to hell, which is below you, that seeping pus of lake, hot, hot, boiling pus that is there for eternity. So you have no idea whether you're going to make it across. You could be the most righteous person. You could have done all the best deeds in your life, but you have no idea whether or not you're going to be thrown down to hell. I have a friend uh, who became a Christian because he asked his father, who is an imam, what happens if your good deeds are equal to your bad deeds? Here's a good one. Ask your Muslim friends that one. The thing is they don't know where they stand. There's no scale that is given. There's no readout on their computer. There's nothing, there's no reference point that they can know how good their good deeds are versus their bad deeds. And that's why you see many Muslims striving to get as many good deeds as possible. The barakah, they're trying to create as much barakah as they can. I remember going to a mosque and here all the men, they were all standing in long lines and they went, there's a man that was responsible for making sure every toe touched. So your toe had to touch the next person's toe. Now, I wasn't part of that, I just was observing it. Uh, just so you don't get me wrong, because I've had many Muslims who've seen me in a mosque believe that I become a Muslim. They're hoping to hell that I would become a Muslim. And I say, no, I'm not a Muslim. I'm just watching you. But why are you touching your toes? And the reason they're touching their toes is because the more toes that touch, the more barakah they get. <laughs> That's why you don't have people all over the mosque. They're all in long lines. Did you know that? That's the reason. Their toes have to touch because in doing that, they receive more barakah. Fascinating, isn't it? If they read the Quran all the way through during the time of Ramadan, especially during the night of power, that night when Muhammad supposedly went on back of the winged horse called the Burak, and when he went on that winged horse up to Jerusalem, and then from Jerusalem he went up to the seven heavens, met Allah, and when he was there with Allah, said, Allah said, come on down and you'll, you go on down and you have 50 prayers you're to do. He went down two heavens and met Moses. Moses, how many times did he tell you to pray? He says, 50. He says, ah, it's too many. See if you can bring it down. So he goes back up to the seventh heaven, brings it down to 45, comes back to Moses, says, nah, bring it down again. Goes back and forth between Allah and Moses, bring it down from 50 to 45 to 30, down to 25, down to 10, finally down to 5. Moses says, okay, that's enough. So head on back down to earth. Now, what that seemed to suggest, those five prayers that we talked about earlier this evening had nothing to do with Allah, had everything to do with Moses. But that happened supposedly in 624 when Muhammad had that night of power and then he comes on back then to uh, Mecca on the winged horse from Jerusalem and that's why that rock is so famous, the dome of the rock that's there in Jerusalem, that's where he ascended to the seven heavens. Now that night of power is celebrated during the Ramadan fast and when you read the Quran during that night you could get anywhere from 200 to 500 times more barakah than if you read the Quran your whole life any other time of the year. Mathematical equations, there's a books out there where you can get whole mathematical equations as to how much barakah you get depending on which way you face or how many times you do it or how, how fast the wind's blowing. Fascinating, all these mathematical equations that give you delineations so you can somehow work off your good deeds versus your bad deeds. Man, I'm glad I don't have to do that. There's nothing we can do about that, not a thing. We're all judged, aren't we? But we know where we're going, don't we? Every one of you here who knows Jesus Christ knows that you don't have to worry about any razor sit up bridge that you have to walk across and be thrown down to hell if a God has a bad day. <laughs> Thank God. God had one bad day and he took that sin for us. And because of what he did, we know we're going straight to heaven. We have that assurance. Isn't it great to be able to say that with confidence? Isn't it great to be able to say to your Muslim friend, I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? No, you don't. You only hope you know where you're going. Have you done enough good things? Doesn't matter how many good deeds you do. Remember, as we said last week, it only took one sin to throw Adam and Eve out of God's presence. Just one sin. That's all it took. Who in the world can believe that we could ever get back into God's presence? We cannot. There's not a thing we can do about it. It all comes back to God. Thank God for what he did. 
took care of that. So I know I'm going to be with him. I know we're going to be walking for eternity. And I know what's on the other side of death. I don't have to fear. There's my confidence. We have certainly an assurance. They only have a hope. And what is it we're going to find there? Well, for Muslims, as I said last week, and some of this is repeating from last week because many of the six beliefs follow what we were doing last week, they're going to this beautiful heaven. Uh, sorry, this beautiful paradise. It's a paradise. And here's something that you women can actually get into good discussions with. I have people on my team do this all the time. You women, don't I? Ask you to ask the women who you talk to, what happens in Surah 55 and Surah 56? What's waiting for you there? It's paradise. They have a belief in paradise. It's one of the six beliefs. But what do they have waiting for you? Not much. Unless you're going to wait on men for the rest of your life. Do you like doing that even on this life? No. Maybe that's why some of you want three others to help you out. My next door neighbor, all the time, it was not he that wanted four wives, it was his wives that wanted other wives, so they could dump all the work on them. And you had senior wives and second and third and fourth wives who got to do all the work of the first wife. And that's why my, my friend said, that my biggest trouble in life are my four wives. He wished he could go back to one. I said, I've only got one, thank God. And she's enough to handle. But certainly, what is waiting for women in heaven? What is there for you? Ask your Muslim friends that. Because it seems a very carnal environment, as we said last week, it's an environment only for men. Well, if men want that, wine, women, and song, nothing more, nothing less. Lots of rivers of water, rivers of wine, the thing they can't touch here, they're gonna swim it up there. The women that they cannot look on here and they have to cover them up and put their purdas and their chadors and their hijabs and all these other accoutrements to cover their beauty so they cannot be seen, so they don't see seduce men, which seem to suggest that it's the women who are guilty for the man's problems. That which they cannot do here, they can have 72 of them, according to some traditions, up there. To me, these are imponderable. And I think we need to start asking some disturbing questions about it. I think we have a right to do that. I think you need to ask, if this is the paradise that's waiting for you, do you really want to go there as women? Is this something that really attracts you? It doesn't even attract me as a man. Because it's missing the most important ingredient. It's missing Jesus. It's missing God. It's missing the per very person that was there with Adam and Eve. That's who I want to be with. That's who I want to be talking and walking with. That's the person I can't wait to see. And that's the person that we have waiting for us because of what he did 2,000 years ago. Now, carnal, male-dominated par paradise where man and woman can fall again and God's not present. So those are the five practices and the six beliefs. That's all it takes. That's all you have to know. That's all you have to do. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a very simple religion. It's a very rational religion. It's one of the attractions why many people come to Islam because they find in Islam no mystery. It's one of the difficulties we have as Christians because there, there are these imponderables, there are these mysteries. The Trinity is mysterious. It's difficult to explain. It's hard to define, let alone defend. The idea that God could become man and what that means and how that impacts not only on human history but also on our history and what it means to us personally. These are difficult to explain in a public context. We're gonna show you how to do that in a few weeks. Can you then see that why so many Muslims are attracted to Islam? Can you then see why, no you can't because you're a woman, I can see that. <laughs> but this is one of the big attractions of Islam, is its simplicity. If that's all you have to know, and that's all you have to do, then that's all you're gonna get. Because you've missed God in all of that. 